um, in uh, this. Um, and so our next talk is going to be genetics of Parkinson's disease. And it's going to be given by um, Dr. Emily Forbes. Uh, she's a board certified neurologist, assistant professor of neurology. And um, she uh, went to medical school at the New York Institute of Technology College of Osteopathic Medicine and did her neurology residency here at the University of Colorado. Then she did her fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorder Center um, and recently came back to join us, uh, particularly specializing in uh, genetics. So um, her research interests include uh, understanding factors that affect the progression of Parkinson's, um, cognitive impairment in Parkinson's, and understanding the genetic basis of neurological disorders. So um, thank you, Emily, for talking to us about this very important topic. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Dr. Emily Forbes. I'm a movement disorders neurologist here at the University of Colorado. Today, we are going to talk about a subject that is of particular interest to me, which is the role of genetics in Parkinson's disease. So I have no financial disclosures related to the material in this presentation. An outline of today's talk includes a review of the basics of genetics, then we're going to move on and talk about Parkinson's disease and genetics. And then we're going to move on and talk about research and clinical trials in genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. So let's start with our Genetics 101 review. We have trillions of cells in our body and within each cell is a complete copy of our genomes. The genome is the complete genetic instructions or blueprints required to build living things. The genome is very long and gets condensed neatly into chromosomes, which you can see here, looking like an X shape. All of your cells have a copy of the genome and different portions are active in different cells. The genome is made up of a chemical called deoxyribonucleic acid, which is what DNA stands for, and uses four chemicals, which you can see here as guanine, adenine, thymine, and cytosine. And those chemicals form three letter words. Each word codes for a building block for a protein. So on the right here, you can see DNA is transcribed into this intermediate and then translated into the protein based on those three letter words. Proteins carry out the functions of our cells. The genome itself contains three billion letters and each has a counterpart, so each letter is really a pair. However, only 1-2% to 2 of that DNA information is used to make protein, resulting in approximately 20,000 genes encoded by the DNA. Now, while that leaves more than 98% of the genome that does not make protein, it does contain important regulatory elements and provides support for the regions that contain proteins so that all these genes can be expressed in the right way in the right time. So we have three billion base pairs, and you may be wondering how all that information fits into our cells. DNA is condensed into chromosomes, that X-shaped structure noted on the last slide. Chromosomes get passed down from your parents. You get 23 from your father and 23 from your mother. So in total, you have 23 pairs of chromosomes. This is shown in the image on this slide. If you inherit a non-functioning gene from one parent, in some situations, the good copy can compensate. However, in some situations, having just one faulty copy is enough to cause disease. We'll come back to this concept and talk about how it pertains to Parkinson's disease a little later. It is important to note that many errors in DNA are harmless, and as we obtain genetic information from more and more people, we are better able to determine which changes are the cause of a disease and which are part of the normal human variation that makes us all unique. Humans are 99.9% .9 identical in our genetic makeup. There is some normal variation in the genes, 
Then there are also mutations, which are permanent changes in the DNA sequence as the sequence differs from what is found in most people. Some mutations have no effect on how we function. For example, somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000 years ago, a genetic mutation led to blue eye color, but had no, no change in how the eye functioned. However, some mutations are clearly associated with disease. There are also many mutations that have unknown consequences, and one of the challenges of modern day genetics is determining if certain mutations have the capacity to cause disease. Now, broadly speaking, there are two forms of mutation. The first is autosomal dominant mutations. And so these are mutations in which one non-working copy can cause symptoms. There are also recessive mutations. And in recessive mutations, you need to have two non-working copies to cause symptoms. Over on the left, outlined in black, you can see a mutation whereby a C is switched to a T. And so this might be a Bonyan mutation, or it might be a mutation that can cause disease. So a common analogy we use to summarize genetics is that genes provide instructions to proteins which all of our cells need to function. And in this way, genes are like blueprints. And if we have genes that don't have many mistakes or don't have any mutations that cause disease, we have a solid foundation that could potentially build a solid house. If there is a typo in the blueprints, there is potential that the results may be problematic. Now that we've covered the basics of genetics, we're going to move on to Parkinson's disease and genetics. So Parkinson's disease was first described in 1817 by Dr. James Parkinson. He described three of his own patients and three patients he observed from afar and grouped people together based on these observations without a way to confirm the diagnosis. It is notable that he and subsequent neurologists described features in Parkinson's disease that we still use today to diagnose the disease. And on the right, you can see a copy of his original essay, which he called the shaking palsy and was later renamed Parkinson's disease. In early 1900s, scientists discovered that abnormal protein deposits disrupt the brain's normal functioning in people not only with PD, but some other types of neurodegenerative diseases. And so what they ultimately found was the Lewy body. And so you can see a Lewy body here on the right. It's that pink circle with an arrow pointing to it. And so a Lewy body is a body that's made up of clusters of what's called alpha synuclein, which is a protein that when mutated clusters abnormally. In the early to mid 1900s, scientists also found that cell loss in an area called the substantia nigra was responsible for Parkinson's disease. And so the picture on the right describes where the substantia nigra is. So you're looking at the brain as if it was cut in a section, as you can see on top. And that middle part is um, shown on the right, on the top part, you can see the substantia nigra is that dark line, and that dark line is missing in Parkinson's disease due to cell loss. So as we talk, as we talk about the history of Parkinson's disease, I also want to mention a little bit about genetics. While this was going on, in 1953, the structure of DNA was determined, and this earned its discoverers, Dr. Watson and Dr. Crick, a Nobel Prize. However, for several decades thereafter, Parkinson's was still thought to be caused by environmental etiologies. There was no known genetic cause before the late 1990s. In 1990, an Italian family was identified as having a likely genetic cause of PD. Scientists observed that over five generations, numerous people in every generation had Parkinson's disease. And so that's what led them to think that there was likely a genetic cause. In 1997, the first mutation causing Parkinson's disease was found in the gene that makes the protein alpha-synuclein. And so you might remember this from a few minutes ago when we talked about alpha-synuclein aggregating abnormally into Lewy bodies, which had been discovered decades earlier. This was a huge step for understanding Parkinson's disease and the genetics of Parkinson's disease. The next, things that, the next thing that scientists did was to look for the mutation in other people with Parkinson's disease, not just this family. 
However, it is notable that this mutation was absent outside of the family. And this was an early indication that the genetics of Parkinson's disease is very complex. So now it's been over 20 years. And in the 20 years since the first gene was discovered, variants in more than 20 genes have been linked to the development of Parkinson's disease. Some of the genes are clearly associated with PD. However, the significance of some of these genes is debated by researchers. There are also dozens of genes that are being looked into as candidate genes to be associated with Parkinson's disease. However, researchers and scientists are still determining their association. We've also found that about 15% of people with PD have a genetic cause. And so the picture on the right, you can see the outline on the outer circle has numbers, one, two, three, going up clockwise to 22. Those all re represent chromosomes. And so you can see on chromosome one, if you look at the interior letters, there's a GBA mutation. So all those interior letters represent mutations. So chromosome one, there's a GBA mutation. And let's look down to the left, on chromosome 12, there's a LARP2 mutation. So those two mutations are the mutations we're going to spend a little bit more time on today. But this also goes to show how many genes and how complex Parkinson's disease genetics can be. Let's take a closer look at the two most common autosomal dominant risk factors for Parkinson's disease, which are GBA and LARP2. It's important to remember that genetic mutations in these genes are risk factors for developing Parkinson's disease. For example, the GBA mutation or GBA mutations are the most common risk, genetic risk factor for PD. However, most recent data indicate that only 9.1% of people who are carriers for this gene will develop PD. The difficulty with genetic testing in PD is that having the mutation only increases your risk. It does not guarantee that you will get the symptoms. There are other factors, including environmental factors, that can increase your risk. So you might remember being at your doctor's office and having them ask you if you've ever been exposed to pesticides or well water or Agent Orange, because these are all environmental risk factors for PD. There are also regulatory elements in the 98% of the genome that does not encode for proteins that potentially can act as risk factors. So there's a lot going on here. And so one of the points I wanted to make, and I'll talk about this again a little bit later, is that if you have a family history of Parkinson's, but you have no symptoms, we generally do not do genetic testing. And the reason for this is if you do have the gene, it's no guarantee that you will develop the disease. Furthermore, if you do not have the gene, you may still develop Parkinson's disease. Remember, about 85% of people with PD have no genetic cause. First, let's talk about the GBA gene. So the GBA gene encodes for the protein glucocerebrosidase. Now this is an autosomal dominant mutation, so you only need one copy to cause risk of disease. And there's an interesting story of how this gene was found to be associated with Parkinson's disease. Young people with two copies of the GBA mutation have for a long time been known to have another disease called Gaucher's disease. Physician researchers observed that people with Gaucher's disease had a higher chance of developing Parkinson's disease, and this is how the association was discovered. Now, GBA mutations are present in about 2 to 30 percent of people with PD. This is a pretty broad range, and this can be on the higher end for people with Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, or it might be on the lower end for people with, for example, Norwegian ancestry. A mutation in one GBA gene increases the chances of developing PD. By age 65, the risk is 2.2%, and by age 85, the risk is 10.9%. So one of the questions you might ask is, do people with GBA mutations have similar symptoms? Now, you've probably been to your physician and asked them, what is my course going to be like? What is this going to look like? And you might have gotten a kind of frustrating answer that everybody's different and it's really hard for us to predict what's going to happen on an individual level. And that's true. And one of the things that scientists, researchers, and physicians are trying to do is look at people just with a GBA mutation, for example, and see if there's any difference between people who just have the GBA mutation and other people with Parkinson's disease. Now, part of the difficulty of this question is not only can you have a GBA mutation, 
But GBA is a long gene, and there are a lot of different places in the gene where people have been shown to have mutations. So does it depend somewhat on where the mutation is in the gene? So it can get pretty complicated. Overall, people with PD who carry a GBA mutation are not easily recognizable because they do not have exclusive features that would clearly distinguish them from people with general PD. However, there are some common traits. Oftentimes, people with GBA mutations present at an earlier age, about three to six years earlier. They often have more cognitive impairments, so trouble with thinking and memory, and a higher risk of dementia. And then hallucinations and REM sleep behavior disorder, which is acting out dreams during sleep, is more common. So what can the GBA mutation tell us about Parkinson's disease in general? Well, everybody has some range of function of the glucoserebrosidase protein. So GBA encodes for glucoserebrosidase, and so some people have a little bit of less function. Some people have glucoserebrosidase that functions at a little bit of a higher level. It's just there's some variation. And so impaired glucoserebrosidase has been found in people with PD who did not carry a mutation for the gene. And this suggests that this protein has a central role in the pathogenesis of Parkinson's disease. And that's why treatment trials that aim to improve or increase glucoserebrosidase are being tried not only in people who have a GBA, GBA mutation, but also in people with PD who do not have a GBA mutation. Let's move on to LARC2. LARC2 stands for leucine rich repeat kinase 2. It is also an autosomal dominant mutation meaning that, again, you only need one copy to cause risk for disease. Mutations in LARC2 occur in 5 to 13% of familial PD and 1 to 5% of sporadic PD. And again, there's some variability based on your ancestry. In Ashkenazi Jewish ancestry, up to 30% of patients with PD can carry this, and in North African Arab Berbers, up to 36% of patients with PD can carry this. So we can ask the same question that we ask about GBA, do people with LARC2 have similar symptoms? Again, it's difficult to tell any difference between LARC2 carriers and Parkinson's disease in general. Now that we've talked about Parkinson's disease and genetics, you might be asking yourself, well, I have Parkinson's disease. Should I get genetic testing? If you have PD and you're interested in clinical trials, then it's a good idea to talk to your doctor about genetic testing. So it is important to remember that no specific genetic treatments are available for any genetic causes of PD currently. Everything's in clinical trial stages. It's also important to remember that the majority of people with PD do not have a genetic cause. And we're going to touch back on this. I have a family member with PD. Should I be tested? If you have no signs or symptoms of Parkinson's disease, the testing is not recommended. Remember, many people with a mutation never develop symptoms. And most people with PD do not have a genetic mutation. So it is possible that you can have no genetic mutation but still develop PD. Lastly, if you have a family member with PD, your risk is a little higher even without genetic testing. So we've talked about Genetics 101 and we've talked about Parkinson's disease and genetics. So let's move on and talk about research and clinical trials in genetic forms of Parkinson's disease. A universal therapy for Parkinson's disease is unlikely to be found. Right now, we use carbidopa levodopa, also known as Cinemed, and other forms of dopamine replacement to help with symptoms, but it does not change the course of PD. Therefore, a per personalized medicine approach, also known as a precision medicine approach, is used to tailor treatments to each person's specific mutation. Right now, clinical trials are underway for GBA and LARC2-related Parkinson's disease. So let's first talk about GBA Parkinson's disease and clinical trials that are underway. So there's the Movis PD trial, which is a trial of an oral drug called Venglustat. The phase one is completed and they're currently finishing phase two. They're now moving towards a third phase of the trial and so we're waiting to hear for selected as a site. There's the AIM-PD, 
trial, which is a trial of another oral medication called Ambroxol, they finished their phase two trial and the results were published earlier this year. Right now, the Cure Parkinson's Trust, which is in charge of this trial, is planning the next steps. There are also two very small trials of gene therapy for PD delivered directly into the brain. And those are only being done at a few select sites. And there are a couple other things in the pipeline. There's RTB101, so it's a compound. That name is similar to names that they give medic or drugs before they become medications. Um, this particular study was on hold due to the coronavirus. There's another compound called LTI-291. That one has plans for a phase two trial in 2021. So things are coming. There are many other things earlier in the pipeline, but these are the, the ones that are most LARP2 Parkinson's disease. So I'm just going to touch on two trials. One is a trial of a compound called PIIB094. It's in a phase one study to evaluate the safety and tolerability of an intrathecal medication. So intrathecal medications are medications delivered directly into the CSF via a procedure that's similar to a lumbar puncture or spinal tap or epidural. So a needle is placed and medications injected into your spine and your lower back. This trial is ongoing. And then there's another trial of two very similar compounds, DNL-201 and DNL-151. They both completed a phase one trial, and the plan is to review the data and select one of these compounds to progress to a phase two slash three trial this year. Now, if you have PD, but you're not interested in or eligible for a medication trial, but you'd still like to contribute and participate in research, you, have, you do have options. There are large databases that are gathering information on the genetics of Parkinson's disease that's still available to you. So we're gonna go through a few of these. First, the Michael J. Fox Foundation is collaborating with 23andMe, and you can go online and register at the Michael J. Fox Foundation. They have their own separate Fox Insight website where you can participate online and share your experience. And there's a, a video of how to get started. So if that's something you're interested in and want to learn more about, I urge you to go to their website. The PDE Generation Study is through the Parkinson's Foundation and they offer free genetic testing and genetic counseling for people with Parkinson's disease. Right now, they're only looking at a handful of mutations, including the GBA and LARC2 mutations. And we have a good chance of becoming a site in 2021. So if this is something you might be interested in, please keep in touch with your neurologist and let them know. There's the ROPAD study, which is the Rostock International Parkinson's Disease Study. So this is an international observational study of people with Parkinson's disease and high-risk populations. So their goal is to recruit 10,000 participants over two years, ending next September 2021, in order to analyze how common LARP2 is in people with PD. They're also looking for people with PD-related gene mutations other than LARP2. So their primary goal is to identify 1,500 LARP2 mutations and about 500 people with other mutations that cause PD. They're also looking for biomarkers for the LARP2 positive groups. So looking for ways to help predict who will get PD. Another trial is the Global Parkinson's Genetics Program, or GP2. This is a very ambitious five-year program where they want to collect genetic information from over 150,000 volunteers around the world to further understand the genetic architecture of Parkinson's disease. And if you're interested in something a little closer to home, the University of Colorado is working with the Colorado Center for Personalized Medicine to establish a biobank. So they collect blood samples from hundreds of thousands of patients to perform research to better understand genetics behind disease in general. And we can work with this team to make sure PD is represented so that we can better understand how common these mutations are in our population. If you're a patient at any UCH health clinic, you can go onto My Health Connection to sign up. So a few last words in Parkinson's disease genetics. I just want to remind everybody that the way you live can have an effect on how your genome works. So there are many people out there 
with genetic mutations, for example, GBA mutations, who do not develop Parkinson's disease. And the reasons for this are of interest to researchers. And while this is being worked out, it's very important to note that maintaining good cardiovascular health with exercise, good diet, and avoiding bad habits is very important to slow the progression of Parkinson's disease. So in summary, precision medicine is at the forefront of clinical trials for Parkinson's disease, particularly for GBA and LARP2 mutations. Efforts are being made to make genetic testing financially feasible. So if you looked into this two or three or four years ago because you were interested, but it was financially prohibitive, then it is worth it to bring it up again with your clinician because the situation may have changed. If you have PD, please talk with your provider about options for genetic testing. It's also worth noting that we here at the University of Colorado are developing a new neurogenetics clinic to help guide people with potential genetic diagnoses or known genetic diseases. And if this is something you would be interested in, please ask your provider for more information. I want to thank you all for coming today, and please submit all your questions so that we can address all of them. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Forbes. Um, I am uh, uh, going to introduce the next speaker uh, and our last uh, speaker, um, Dr. Dan Kramer. Uh, he will be talking about